Well, good morning, and thank you, everybody. thank you all for coming. Appreciate you showing up and, and uh, showing an interest in our company. Um, before I call the meeting to order, I'd just like to remind anybody that everybody, what we're going to do is uh, we, we videotape these and put them on our, our website so that shareholders who want to tune into the meeting later can do so. So if you do have a question, can you just put your hand up first? Um, and that will enable uh, Liz to come over with the microphone and for me to duck out of the room. So, so at any rate, just put your hand up so she can get a mic to you, and we have everybody everybody sort of tuned into that. So uh, I'm Tom Caldwell. I'm president and CEO of Urbana Corporation. Welcome, everyone. Um, we have our directors here, and I'd ask them to stand. Uh, Beth, Beth Colley, uh, Michael Gundy, uh, Charlie Panic. Uh, George Elliott is one of our directors, and uh, he's uh, unfortunately out of town in California. His daughter's very ill, so he's, uh, he's been excused. Uh, I will preside uh, as chair of the meeting, and Harry Liu, possibly Harry, you could just stand for a second. And Harry Liu, uh, the secretary of the corporation, will act as secretary of the meeting. And I'll ask uh, uh, Radha Mulchan Singh if she could, uh, she's a representative of AST Trust Company, they're the registrar and transfer agent for the corporation to act as scrutineer. Um, notice calling this meeting in the accompanying management information circular, the financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2017. The auditor's report have been duly mailed to all shareholders of the corporation entitled to receive notice, which includes holders of uh, both common shares and uh, non-voting Class A shares. Additional copies of these materials are available uh, at this meeting. The proxy forum has also been sent to all common shareholders who are entitled to vote at the meeting. Uh, with the consent of the meeting, the rating of notice of the meeting will be dispensed with, uh, dispensed with. The secretary of the meeting has filed with me proof of service of the notice of the meeting and management uh, information circular, proxy forum, financial statement, and auditor's report. And I direct the secretary to annex uh, the notice and proof of service to the minutes of the meeting. Uh, now, prior to this meeting, the scrutiny reported on the common shareholders present and the number of proxies received for common shareholders. And I will call upon the secretary of the meeting to read that report. I have read the scrutineer's report on attendance, which states that there are a total of 36 common shareholders present in person or represented by proxy, holding 6.5 million common shares. This meets the quorum requirements of the corporation for the purpose of this meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, I declare that with the notice having been properly given in accordance with the Business Corporations Act of Ontario, the requisite quorum of shareholders being present, this meeting is properly constituted for the transaction of business for each of the resolutions that follows. Only the shareholders of common shares uh, are entitled to vote. Um, by the way, did we, in terms of our vote, we have in favor, did we announce that or not? I keep going. Okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> I'm getting older, you see. I forget the regime of this thing. Um, <laughs> keep the suspense. <laughs> uh, the meeting of the shareholders meeting on um, May the 10th, 2017, are available for inspection by shareholders. If there's no objection, I will entertain a motion to approve those minutes. I move that the minutes of the shareholders meeting held on May 10th, uh, 2017, be approved. Uh, seconder. Brendan Caldwell, all in favor? Thank you. Contrary? Carried unanimously. The first item of business to place before the meeting, and by the way, the way we typically have our AGM is we get through all the mechanical, legal requisites and get it over with, and then, we, then I spend my time then giving my talk about the President's report and we have a, a presentation by Richard Carlton, who's the CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange, which is a significant investment for us and is doing very, very well. So we'll, we'll get the stuff done we need to get done, and then we can spend as much time as, as we need on the latter part. So the first item of business is place before the meeting the financial statements of the corporation for the year end, December 31st, 2017. These financial statements, together with a report of the auditor dated March 9th, 2018, have been duly mailed uh, to all shareholders of the corporation. The report of the audit to the shareholder meeting is open for inspection at this meeting. Is there any question 
on the report of the financial statements. Did anyone read it? Anyway, <laughs> the next uh, item is the uh, uh, election of directors. Uh, I declare the meeting open for nominations, not really, um, for the election of directors for the ensuing year or until their successor is elected or appointed. Uh, I nominate Thomas S. Caldwell, Beth Cauley, George D. Elliott, Michael B. C. Gundy, and Charles A. V. Pennock individually and not as a slate for election as directors of the corporation. Are there any further nominations? I declare the nominations closed. May I have a motion to elect those nominated as directors of the corporation? I move that each of the persons who have been nominated be elected director of the corporation for the ensuing year or until his or her successor is elected or appointed. May I have a seconder to that motion, please? Brendan Caldwell again. Uh, all in favor? Contrary? Carried. I declare those nominated to have been elected as a director of the corporation for the ensuing year or until his or her successor has been elected or appointed. The next item of business is the appointment of auditor for the, next, uh, for the current year. May I now have a motion to appoint Deloitte LLP as auditor of the corporation? I move that Deloitte LLP be hereby appointed auditor of the corporation to hold office until the close of the next annual meeting of shareholders or until its successor is appointed at such remuneration as may be fixed by the directors and the directors are authorized to fix such remuneration. Thank you. I always keep thinking someone's talking behind me here. I keep looking around at that. I'll, uh, I need a seconder of the motion, please. Andrew Sturpey, all those in favor? Contrary? Carried unanimously. Any further business to be brought before this meeting? As there's no further business, I will entertain a motion to conclude the meeting. I move the meeting be terminated. Uh, may I have a seconder, please? Mike, so Mike Gundy, all in favor? Contrary? I declare the meeting terminated. Now this ends the official part of the meeting and I'm leaving. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say that. <laughs> have a nice morning. Um, I'm gonna. I'll. I'll do the first part, talking about the year and the first quarter, and uh, and I'm open to any questions at all. Uh, you know, if you'd like to ask any about it. Um, <clears throat> Last year was an interesting year in, in many ways, and uh, our our per share asset value grew, but about just under 15 percent, 14.8 percent. That was versus a nine percent gain for the TMX uh, total composite return. Our U.S. financial services component. Uh, grew at 43 percent, which was a good year for the U.S. banks, uh, and that's the total return of the U.S. dollar uh, terms. Uh, uh, to, um, the total return was 28.1 percent for, for the Dow Jones. Um, the long-term annually compounded a rate of return since December 2002, uh, or October 2002 to December 2017 was 16.1 percent annually compounded, that's over double uh, Buffett and Fairfax, by the way, just in case you're, you're wondering where we fit into the crowd uh, or beyond the crowd. Last year was kind of interesting. We had very low interest rates, uh, U.S. tax and regulatory changes. Mr. Trump was well received domestically in those, in those matters. Canada, we've been you know, wrestling back and forth with NAFTA. Our view was U.S. dollar might do better than the Canadian dollar, but it's been really wobbling around a little bit. And actually, that went against us for a while, but now it's going back in favor of us again. Um, we had two, uh, two of our companies, uh, private companies, do their initial public offering last year, uh, Real Matters and the Bombay Stock Exchange. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we've talked about the nature of um, public markets and how they've changed dramatically. And Frankly, going public, a private company going public, is not a guarantee of a price lift. It, the world doesn't work that way anymore. Um, there's often a digested uh, digestion or an unload period, if you will. Uh, the, uh, our investment in the Canadian Securities Exchange, CNSX, we have it as here, as the operator of the Canadian Securities Exchange, has been uh, terrific. It's been a great year, uh, particularly with the marijuana stocks. Um, 
I think uh, it's interesting because I don't smoke, and you know, my grandkids think I'm the king of pot now. So I, <laughs> I don't know whether it uh, adds to or it doesn't add to, but it's been a great business, and uh, that business has done well. Terrific team there, but I'll, I'll let Richard talk about that. Our mineral property in urban township. We're going to stand down in terms of doing work. We're, frankly, we're in a poker game there. Right now, everybody's, uh, oh, Cisco is immediately to the north. They spent, I don't know, $60, $70 million in drilling. And, uh, and people are doing significant work all around us. So the way we see playing this for the, for the time being is to wait until someone has a major ore body. And we're actually in the center of this whole uh, urban township play, which is, by the way, uh, probably the, the hottest gold play in the world, not just Ontario or Canada. So uh, we're going to sit and wait, but we aren't waiting, doing nothing. We're spending a significant amount of money doing what's called a 43-101 uh, analysis of all the property there, combining all the work done even since the 40s, uh, digitizing all the drilling records. And we're going to post that online, by the way. For those of you who are a serious geologist, you can take a look at it. And <clears throat> we'll just put it online. We're not, you know, we're not, we don't have a secret. If somebody wants to do a deal with us, they're going to want to see a 43-101. But it's, it's a pretty, it's a document that can run oh, anywhere between fifty to $70,000. But to have that on file and put it all together at this point as opposed to just punching holes in the ground. And once we've got that, let's see who has an interest in it. Because we, we, we don't want to be in the mining business full time. This is an investment company, if you will. But we may go beyond investments, and I'll mention that in the next bit here. I mentioned in the annual report, you know, they got that thing in the subway, mind the gap. Uh, I think I mentioned that in the report. And clearly, uh, we have this gap between asset value and price, shareholder price. And that's the nature of a lot of these closed end and uh, type vehicles. Uh, and uh, I want you to know that the management of this company spends significant time thinking about that and taking actions in that regard. And, and uh, maybe it's something that just is going to be because what's happening in capital markets is that with the large bank brokers, nobody does any research or following or recommendation of junior or mid companies. And Urbana, even though we have $250 million or thereabouts, is still a junior mid-sized company. So uh, brokers are actively discouraged against that. So these stocks become orphans. I, I'll give you a good example. We have a fund called the Canadian Value Momentum Fund, which deals in more junior caps. And it's the top performing Canadian fund because all these stocks are orphans. And frankly, Urbana is one of them. So, you know, what are we doing about the gap? And, and I know shareholders are concerned about that. And, and maybe it's a, a, the nature of the beast. Maybe it's the nature of markets. Uh, maybe uh, if I look at the other things like uh, Canadian General Investments or Economic Mutual Trust, Investment Trust, they all have this gap between asset value. Maybe that is the holding. But, but if we go back and say, okay, what has management done about this thing? Well, number one, our performance has been good, even with the downdraft in the first quarter of this year, we're still over 15% annually compounded for 15 years. I mean, nobody's close to that. That blows the doors off anybody, if anybody's thinking about it. So management's got performance. What the other thing we did? Well, we bought back virtually half of all the A shares. There is not, there is not a, a closed end or investment company or corporation that I'm aware of that's bought back half their stock in the markets to try to give shareholders the advantage of the discount. Uh, we've done that. We started a dividend. First a nickel plus a five cent extra. Last year we changed it to seven cent regular dividend, three cent extra. Uh, and we've done that. Uh, we did some PR this year. There's a couple of the ads we've had in investment executive. Because you see, our market is not the end shareholder. Our market is the broker. And to, to, so we've been putting a couple of these ads in just not, not that people are going to look at the ad and say, wow, i got to go buy some Urbana, but it, it it's, adds to an awareness of the company. And that's really what we're trying Just be aware of the company. We're not, nobody's going to buy a stock in an ad, but I've, heard, I've talked to people and say you haven't heard of Urbana. Uh, I've traveled much of this country with, uh, with Charlie and, and, and with Richard talking about our investments and about Urbana. So, you know, we've done, we got the performance, we did the buybacks, the dividends, the PR, and uh, running around the countryside. And eventually, I, I, you know, and I just give you this as a sort of a thought on a go-forward basis. Uh, it may be at some point in time Urbana has to become more of an operating company so that we can be evaluated on earnings. Earnings, like it or not, they're hard to get, but once you've got them, you, you, it's a simple multiple. You know, people invest on the basis of earnings. 
So that's something that just I'm giving you a heads up that management is thinking about. And if we do decide to move more in the direction of an operating company, it's, you know, you don't have to be brilliant to know we'll probably stay within the confines of the securities or investment or financial areas. That's where we have a, a modicum of expertise. Um, danger spots, I said at the end of the year for 2018, could be NAFTA, interest rate increase, the ever-present possibility of inflammatory language and behavior coming from Washington causing a trade war. And our American cousins need enemies. You know, if you look at the, just pull back from the States, you know, I've never seen a great big bully say, you know, everybody's taking advantage of us. You know, I've never seen such whiny behavior out of the most powerful country in the world. Oh, it's the South Koreans, it's the Japanese, it's the Chinese, it's the Canadians. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. And they galvanize on the basis of some external threat, real or imagined. And the, the style is, I'm not saying he hasn't got, uh, the president has not got some results for America. I think he has. But this is causing <clears throat> significant instability in markets and, and even indeed adding uh, to volatility because, uh, you know, you have a policy one day, it's changed the next day. It's like playing poker with someone who's, who's, uh, who's uh, insane. You know, you don't know whether they're going <laughs> to wipe the chips off the table, take the cards home, pull a gun, tip the table over. You have no idea. You know, how do you play a game like that? You just, there's, no, there's no sort of theme to it. Uh, I think what's going to happen long term, it's, it's removing America's influence in the world. People, I was talking to an American friend of mine shortly for a little while, and he wanted, didn't want to talk anymore. He said, we're the leaders of the free world. And I said, no, no, to be a leader, you've got to be trusted and respected. You're neither. I mean, the world doesn't think that way. Oh, they'll deal with you because they want to have access to your market, or they don't want to put you off because they want to have your army come and defend them, which they won't. But that's coercion. That's not. That's bribery. That's not. That's not being a leader that somebody you want to follow. And I think you're going to see in Canada. We've been lazy in Canada. Really lazy. We've been just shipping stuff back and forth. And oh, we have a special relationship, and they love us and everything else. No, not the case. You know. And uh, so we haven't built markets around the world. We're playing this silly bear's game of well, we don't want oil pipelines going through this or going through. We import oil into Quebec. It comes from Venezuela. Got tankers coming up the uh, up, up the Gulf of St. Lawrence, delivering oil to refineries in Montreal. But we can't ship Canadian oil there. And then on the other side of the country, we have um, environmental groups, uh, indigenous groups. Saying, oh, you know, this is ancient ceremonial, whatever it is you're going over. So we got to decide one day whether we're going to be a country or not. And we can do so many great things as a country. Canada has incredible potential, and I don't think we can spend a lot of time throwing it away, given the nature of the environment we're in. Um, in January, the market had a serious bam hit on the south side, it just, uh, and that brought volatility back. A lot of these uh, ETFs, exchange-traded funds, they take the volatility out of the market as they did over the year, but when the volatility comes back, it really comes back because then every, an, ET, an exchange-traded fund must sell. And it's not like me as a trader. If a stock goes down too much, I don't have to sell that day. I'll wait till it bounces. They don't. Must sell. And that can add great volatility. And I think we saw some of that at the first part of the year. Um, you know, the, the uh, combination of policy changes, uh, rhetoric, and I think the rhetoric is really the killer, uh, has, has been quite, quite destructive uh, to basically the fabric of markets. Now, without getting, uh, you know, basically too negative here, we've got to think, wait a sec, what is going on in equity markets? At the end of the day, companies are growing, earnings are going up, dividends are increasing, and companies are, all companies now are engaged in massive buybacks of their stock. So despite all the political stuff, uh, the you know, real presidents of Washington or whatever the soap opera is called, you know, you're really seeing fundamental improvement in markets. And that's what the, somebody, one of our partners asked me, where do you think the market's going? I said, the market's going up, period. I don't know when, but all I know, I've been in the business when the, that we, we, uh, when the Dow Jones was under 1,000. Uh, there used to be a musical, How Now Dow Jones, if the Dow would ever get over 1,000. And, uh, you know, so the markets, the economy will grow in spite of us, in spite of politicians, in spite of insanity. The market will still roll on. So those are, I think, are the fundamentals. Uh, what hurt us in the first part of this year? We had, we had almost the perfect storm. We, we did have a pullback uh, in the CBOE, Chicago Board Option Exchange, terrific company, but they're the major trader of the VIX, the Volatility Index. 
and you know the volatility index was boom, boom, all over the place, and then everybody's saying, oh, it's being manipulated, and uh, that was a big hit to us. That was about four or five million dollar uh, pullback on CBOE. Real Matters was the other one, a perfect storm. Real Matters did their IPO at thirteen dollars, and uh, so at thirteen dollars, that was really great. It stock six fifty, so that's pulled about twenty million dollars out of our asset value. Real Matters, I think, is a really neat company. They do uh, real estate appraisals, and they've just taken over a company that does closing and, and title search, which is a big, big business in the States. And if they can get their hands around that business and, and integrate it, and I think they can, they're very good operators, that will be a really cool company. And I think at that point, they're going to have to get listed in New York. And I think that will give us a full valuation, or a lot fuller valuation. And I would not be surprised if that company were not taken over at some point in time. So... You know, there's 25 million, 10% of the portfolio, boom, boom, in two positions kind of thing. And Bombay as well. Bombay went public at a higher price, and it's, it's down about 20% as well. And um, Bombay we've held for many, many years, and, and uh, uh, to date we haven't taken a cheese sandwich out of that company yet. So uh, one of the things we, we realize, we're looking at exchanges now around the world. We're in negotiations for one, uh, another international exchange. So we are looking at this, but it takes a lot of homework. And the danger with going internationally is culture. You can look at a business, that's a good business, but you can get scooped by culture. And that's what happened in India. They changed all the rules once everyone was in, they de facto nationalized, and on and on and on. But in actual fact, uh, the, the pullback we've had, um, and remember, having a pullback in a quarter, I'm not going to lose one night of sleep over that, or even six months, or even having a bad year. You know, the, the point is we have permanent capital, that's a tremendous advantage. We have some really good positions that I think that will come to fruition for us. And uh, that's enough of my rabbiting on. Now, does anyone have any questions or anything they want to talk about? Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Tom. Hi. I was wondering if you could uh, talk about uh, the CSE. I know that there'll be a presentation later, but what I'm wondering about is whether you've received any uh, expressions of interest in the company by other entities wishing to buy it. Yes. And uh, was price discussed? Yes. Was it? Could you give an indication of what that price might be? Uh, we have it in on relation our, to what you have it on the books. We, that, well, that, well, they saw. We made the mistake of showing them our statements. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, they said, "Oh, ninety cents," um, and uh, I said, "That's a non-starter. That's a non-starter." And and Ned Goodman, when he came in to join me in this after we'd started and refunded the company, he made me promise one thing. He said, "Promise me you'll never sell it to a bank." Ned hates banks, and uh, I hate them too, frankly. But I own a lot of them, but. Uh, so it wasn't a bank. But we, we have a really good business here. And I'm not taking that off the table, but that deal is a dead issue. We're, we've just finished our valuations uh, of, of Bombay, or of CSE now. And, uh, the, you know, the, the valuations are made by our CFO and myself. We, we, we come by all the an, an analytical people, and then we have to make the final decision. And, uh, but we're going to show this to our board tomorrow. Um, so I would anticipate that we might take a little bit rosier look at it on our sheets. But we it's a private investment, so we want to be very conservative. I'd rather be known for undervaluing, but, but you know, uh, not to make the auditors of the world feel badly, but this uh, IFRS strives for precision, and you can't get precision on a private equity company. You know, you have all these assumptions, and you put them in, and you try to make your best guess. And, and if anything, and this is sometimes where you get the tug and pull, I would rather be on the low side. I would rather be known for conservative valuations than overinflated valuations. But I, I think we will take a rosier view of it. That's all I can say. Until do, do, we, yeah, does Urbana have the right of first refusal on the shares of other <clears throat> uh, No, other we don't, holders? but we, can, we don't per se, but we have the right to veto anybody else coming in, which is the same thing. And, and uh, we would, <clears throat> listen, we're, you know, we look at investments and, and we want to be part of a business that's growing and CSE has been a wonderful and a great team. I mean, a really, we were so um, happy, relieved when we got involved in that business and saw the people that were there. We thought, whoa, because I'm lazy. I, you know, I don't want to go and have to fire, fire, bring new people. They had the right team, and, and they still do. So I think we wanted to be partic- participating in a business that's going to continue to grow. Uh, <clears throat> if someone came along and said, we're going to offer you, uh, you know, I've told Richard, we're not, we're not selling at ten dollars, I might come back and say, "Richard, I've been wondering. <laughs> you know, I've been sort of thinking about this." <laughs> but you know, it depends. It's like anything; it comes down to the price. But <clears throat> the people that had the interest, we're, we're not going to do because uh, they're not the right partner. Our right partner 
in some ways, but not necessarily in an ownership basis. So, um, <clears throat> we, we, that's something you look at. But right now we're participating in a business that has a great team and it's growing. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, about uh, closing the gap between uh, the net asset value and uh, stock price. Have you thought about doing a substantial issuer bid or Dutch auction? <clears throat> we have done, but we would probably do something if we made a major pass in something. I mean, a big pass. Because, <clears throat> like it or not, $250 million is not a big pool of capital to work with. And also, there's a funny thing that happens. As we did buybacks, we were getting complaints from some shareholders, like Horizon Kinetics in New York, it's a big shareholder of this company, and uh, and also uh, Edgepoint, you know, uh, Bob Crumble's mutual fund. And what happens is we bought stock back. We were pushing them over thresholds where they had to declare or sell stock. So we've got to be careful that we don't shrink the share base such that we really, really are an orphan. And the beauty with the share structure we have is that it, if we can close the gap and, and make no mistake, it's not something I, I can do tomorrow. I can do it tomorrow, but I'll be in jail two days later. Uh, but we, if we can get close to the gap, then we have a currency to go and take over other companies. We have stock that we can give instead of cash. So we'd like to do that. But in terms of, a, of really shrinking our capital base, we want the capital to be bigger. Uh, I think I've said before in these meetings, I'd like to get the capital of Urbana to $1 billion before I drop dead. And uh, that's my goal. It's shallow, but that's 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 the goal, and and uh, so I think I think we we've really tried to exercise. Like we've given back, we're 250, but we've actually returned to shareholders, if you sort of think of it this way, about 100 million dollars in assets by buying stock back, uh, which is a pr and also the dividends are running around <clears throat> five million bucks a year or whatever. So if we made a really big pass, if somebody came and said Bombay, we're going to pay you. You know, an extra thirty, forty, fifty million dollars. We would take ten or twenty million, or something. You know, something like that. We, we would consider. I'm not putting that on the table. That's we'd want to make a big pass before we did that. Yes, Tom. Yes, sir. I see. Uh, if I'm reading it correctly, that you sold Pengrote, and you also sold. Crescent Point. Yes. Any regrets on it now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. But I have so many other regrets. This <laughs> pales into insignificance. <laughs> well, you know, I, I you know I was looking at it. I, we bought some mar some smaller companies in the oil and gas business, and some of the ones around us in urban township, they weren't performing. And you know, you can go, you can make a good argument either way in energy. I mean, because as I say, you're playing poker with a crazy person. Well, this time the crazy person may have drove, driven the oil stocks up. Absolutely. So sometimes the crazy can do crazy stuff. Well, no, he's not. Well, listen, he, his 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 moves with the U.S. banks were wonderful for us, and we loved that. So I I was uh, singing the man's praise. It's only when he crosses me I get negative. But thank you, Tom. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? This gentleman here. I have two questions. Yes, sir. Uh, the first one is on. Um, you mentioned like um, you want potentially convert the company to a operating company. So can you elaborate a little bit of, of that? How you do that? Well, there's nothing to convert. We just will buy a company that provides us some cash flow or some earnings or something. We haven't. It, it's. I'm, I'm really giving you a heads up in terms of thought process. We're not there yet. We haven't really got to that yet. Um, <laughs> but it's, I'm always exploring ideas. I'm always exploring ideas. So to do it, there's no big uh, uh, steps that are, would be required if we did do that. Uh, you know, but I, you see, the one great advantage, you know, you look at Buffett or even, you know, Prem Watts' companies, they have cash flow. Nothing covers sins managing money like cash flow. If you've got money coming in, if something drops in half, you just double the position. But if you have a static pool, which is what we have, if we make a mistake, we've got to trade our way out of that mistake. And that's a little bit tougher. So it's something we've often thought about. We own uh, a company called Highview, which is um, sort of a, an outsourced chief investment officer out in, in uh, Bronte. Great company, wonderful people. And we own about half of that company. 
So, I mean, you might take a bigger position in a company like that, take over the whole thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying high view, but we could add to things we currently have. But we, we, haven't, we haven't come close to bringing it into focus. It's just a, something, should we talk about it? Because we're always talking, uh, at least talking and thinking about strategic moves. Because if I look at what we've done about closing the gap, we've done everything humanly possible to narrow the gap. Everything you can do, whether, whether it be performance, whether it be buybacks, whether it be dividends, whether it be PR things. You know, we've done everything we can do with the thing. And now, mind you, the gap can close. If we have a monster pass and it makes it into the papers, that will close the gap. For example, at one point, this stock had an asset value of $3 and the stock was at $5. And the reason was we owned a whole bunch of New York Stock Exchange seats. We own stuff that you could not buy yourself. So if you want to buy a New York Stock Exchange seat, you had to buy Urbana. And Urbana went to a premium because of that. So a big pass, I'm sorry? Twice, Twice yes. I, I wasn't counting. I was just so grateful for the first time. But, you know, it, it um, own something you can't own another way. Own something that has real profile, that is attractive, and you provide the entree into it. Uh, so there are other ways of doing it, but it... it it requires events and a big pass. Now you had a second question, sir. Oh, yeah. Um, the second question is related to the financial sector. So you, in the past like several years, you, this has been really great, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember, like, actually, um, uh, I think I talked to you about, like, uh, back to 2012. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, you actually, you told me, like, to be patient. So it's actually really good advice, right? So, <laughs> yeah. I'm I really tell everybody happy. that. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I, like, back to the topic, like, the financial sector was doing really good, so the banking stuff. So um, my question is, what do you view about those, um, you know, like, the banking sector? Also, like, um, do you have any new, like, sector you want to go in, like, as a whole, like, you know, the mm -hmm. sector you want hold some stocks? <clears throat> First off, I, I do think we have a big position in the U.S. banking sector. Morgan Stanley, Citicorp, Bank of America, and CBOE. Uh, ICE. Uh, I think the U.S. banking sector has got tremendous earnings horsepower you know, on this, these new regs and everything. They, they, that is going to continue to be a very significant growth area. So I'm going to hold those positions for now. Uh, we did add a little bit to uh, uh, our Suncor uh, Tech Corporation because, you know, you wonder what the dollar, that was up, down. Or, I mean, it's really, it's, it's like shooting in the dark a little bit. Uh, we bought a little bit more in the golds. So we bought, uh, as they say, some Barrick and some Detour Lake on the recommendation of that gentleman sitting in front of you. Uh, <laughs> so you can, you can hit him next year if it doesn't perform. So we have added a little bit of golds, a little bit of energy again. Uh, and again, as the gentleman at the back said, we did leave early on those junior things. We probably should have stayed. But, but um, we're, we're striving for some market performance here around a little bit of deteriora short-term deterioration in some of the private stocks. But uh, I'd, like to, I mean, I'd like to come back and buy some of the Canadian banks. I mean, look at the Canadian banks. Uh, but I, I'm waiting for a real break in the Canadian dollar or something in the housing market that boom, shoots the Canadian banks down. But I wouldn't mind. I mean, you take a look at uh, Bank of Commerce. I think Bank of Commerce is foreign change yield, you know, dividend yield. I mean, that's not bad when you look at what you can get out there. So the bank, Canadian banks have good yields. And they are a protected species. So we might add some more to the Canadian banks, but that would be contingent upon uh, a change in our, our dollar-U.S. dollar relationship. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay. Here comes your microphone. Uh, break uh, Canadian dollar. How long are you going to stay like that? How long is our dollar going to stay where it is? Yeah, it was uh, before... High more than the U.S. And the problem it was the oil. The oil go down, then Canadian dollar follow. Okay. Now the oil go up, still Canadian down. What's go What's going? You think about that? Well, we have our NAFTA discussions going on which can be detrimental <clears throat> to the Canadian dollar. I think also around the world, people are thinking in terms of what currency do I really want to be in? And uh, the Canadian dollar is really a, a tag end off the American dollar. 
And so there's a little bit of a movement to hold less in the way of U.S. Treasuries. A lot of countries are getting pretty annoyed with America. So my gut feel is the Canadian dollar is still vulnerable to the downside, you know, 75 cents. I could be wrong in that, but I, I think it's going, I think the Canadian dollar is going to continue under pressure. And partly it is that we, we, we seem to have a government that's indecisive, and the world in which we now live requires decision-making and courage. And I don't know that we have that kind of leadership. It's just, so I think we're going to drift a little bit. That's just my own gut feel. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Tom, I brought this up last year. I'll just, we could replay the tape, but you, you mentioned all the things that you've done to, or you could possibly do in terms of bridging the gap, net asset value to market price. Um, if you look at the, democrat, the demographics, even in the room here, you see a lot of, a little bit of gray in the hair. And I don't so, see that <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> you wear, it's a your glasses. <laughs> Okay, so my, from my perspective, and, and uh, I am a closed fund investor, so right. I, all the ones you mentioned, CGI and yeah. the ones that operate like closed fund funds like Fairfax and there's a Canoe. Canoe mm -hmm. actually is almost trading at par. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with Canoe. But um, a lot of, um, so I'm just going to bring this question up from what I observe in other closed end funds. They employ uh, um, an option strategy. Right. Where <laughs> I know where you're going. So uh, we could take 10%. Just You could try it this year. I mean, right. you've tried other things. We, we've also tried Bitcoin. Yeah. So if you, try, if you had the guts to try Bitcoin, you should be able to try option strategy. Yeah. Take 10% of some of the American financials. And, and you've, you've also, we're, we're seeing a lot of volatility, which is great for options. Yeah. So just play the volatility game and... Uh, and, and, and Maybe uh, increase, have a semi-annual, have a, a dividend twice a year instead with, with the funds that come from that, you know, selling puts, selling calls. And, um, Problem with twice a year, the costs go up. It's, it's, it's really quite costly for us. Got to find a discount broker. <laughs> 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 but not in terms of div regular dividends coming out. It's, it's, not the, it's not the broker. It's the transfer agent and, and uh, whatever. But we just want to keep it simple with that. I think your comment on option strategy is valid. I, I, um, my concern is particularly, I do the options on the U.S. Bo US banks, but there I've got monster gains in them. And the point is, anytime I sell anything there, I get 12% comes right off the top. I've got to pay taxes on that stuff now because I'm through my tax loss period. So I, I'm worried that I can make money, but I end up with less money to manage kind of thing. So that's part of my thinking. But I'll tell you what, I will look at it. And if you're back here next year, hold my feet to the fire and say, what did you do? How big of a log do I bring? <laughs> <laughs> Very large. <laughs> I'm quite insensitive. There's so. lots of trees that have fallen in the Toronto area lately. Yeah. Oh, but, oh, but oh, you know, I, I'll, I'll, when I'm back today, I will talk to our trading department. Say, you know, come up with a couple of strategies for me and see what you think. But I, I've been very... Uh, I haven't done well in options personally, and I'm arrogant enough to think if I don't do well, nobody can do well, but... You know, I something I should look at it again. Well, maybe take a look. I, I own some uh, BlackRock closed end funds. Right. That um, they um, they employ. They'll take thirty, forty percent. Maybe let's let's say on average on thirty percent of their portfolio, and that's they uh, sell options on that, mm -hmm. and they provide a monthly um, a monthly um, dividend or distribution. Mm -hmm. Some yeah. of it's return of capital. Some of it isn't. Yeah. So maybe you can look at that as an example. Or we'll look at it. I'll do it again. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate that. Right. Um, I'm personally against options, so I, I would prefer not. Well, you and I could talk then. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, you're a kindred spirit. <laughs> I, I will look at it, though, by the way. I will do that. I, I just think there's zero sum game. But anyway, anyways, with uh, the Bombay going public and real matters, the percentage of private investments has, has gone down. Are you going to look to increase that back up? Yes and no. We are looking at private deals all the time. But like it or not, they may be considered public, but they're still private because they're not liquid. And, and so it's, it's, I guess it's a misnomer. It's what's liquid and what's not liquid. We can't really sell that amount of Bombay nor that amount of real matter. So it really is, uh, you know, I, I, I want to know, what, can, I, uh, can I sell a thing? 
And interestingly, some of the private deals, the real work begins after the IPO, where you're talking to management. We're going to talk to management tomorrow on, let's say, real matters, and you're really trying to help out. So it's, it's, uh, it requires just as much work. But we are looking at a couple of private deals right now anyway. So, it, it, you know, the percentage is what the percentage is. I mean, the percentage can be very high, and then all of a sudden something goes public, boom, it comes down to a low percentage, but you're still not liquid. So it, it's, it's, it's liquidity is really the key thing that I look at. And the work involved in a newly public company is sometimes more than it is involved even in a private company. A lot more governance issues and stuff you have to work with. And exposure as a director, too. So Thank you. Well, why don't I do a lateral arabesque and uh, uh, turn the meeting over to the real star of the show who's done a great job this year, you know, Richard Carlton, who's the CEO of uh, the Canadian Securities Exchange. So look forward. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very kindly, Tom. Uh, and uh, on behalf of uh, Adam and myself, uh, those were very kind words uh, for the uh, team at the Canadian Securities Exchange. Um, I could go through charts and stuff and PowerPoint presentations, uh, which uh, for those of you who know Tom well, uh, he absolutely hates. Uh, so instead, uh, before I actually do take you through the charts, which are like completely awesome, um, I want to talk to you today a little bit about disruption. Because the Canadian Securities Exchange, in fact, does represent uh, you know, the new economy and all of this disruption that people are talking about. So one of the roots of the Canadian Securities Exchange was back on a warm August afternoon, probably, sometime in around 1997, 1998, at the Toronto Stock Exchange. And the Toronto Stock Exchange, you'll remember, was receiving plaudits from around the world for being one of the most advanced thinking exchanges. It was the first to go fully electronic. We closed the trading floor. We went to decimals. We had the highest productivity of any of the exchanges uh, operating around the world. And I can remember sitting with my feet up on the desk, because remember, it was a not-for-profit organization, and we did a lot of that in those days. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Work with me here. But we did sit around with our feet up on the table a lot in those days, thinking about how could we make this place better? So we thought, all right, there's no reason that an exchange actually has to own the technology. Where's, where's the advantage there? So with that, we lopped 350 employees off of a 550 employee organization. Then we thought about some of the other functions that the organization did. Surveillance. Well, is that something that the exchange needs to do? How about all the member regulation functions? Again, Mr. Caldwell loves the member regulation folk from those, uh, from those days. No, you don't. Well, I think we managed to get it down to we could run this place with 55 good people. And again, remember, this was one office just, uh, just across the street here. I was wrong. We can actually, with the experience that we've got at the Canadian Securities Exchange, we can run it with 42 people have an office in Vancouver, have local representation in Calgary and Montreal, headquarters here in Toronto, with people looking for deals around the world to bring to the, uh, to bring to the exchange. So when people talk about, you know, why isn't there uh, inflation? Why isn't there, you know, sort of in increasing price and wage pressure, even though, you know, in the United States it's virtually a full employment economy, Canada a little bit less so, it's exactly the kind of story that you see with the Canadian Securities Exchange. You know, it's a bunch of people sitting around with their feet up on the desk going, we can do this better, and with the technology that we've got, we can do this. So the uh, Caldwell organization, Urbana, came in in the uh, uh, 2012 uh, into the organization and led a recapitalization of the Canadian Securities Exchange. We knew that we had a better model and that we offered superior levels of service to the alternatives in, in Canada, that the public markets had been really beaten down by, as a result of the mining and oil and gas exploration slump, and that if we could just have our chance to demonstrate what we could do, not just the exchange, but the entire community, you know, the brokers, the advisors, the lawyers, the accountants, 
that we have the capability of funding whole new industries and providing wealth to the early stage investors who are able to participate alongside the entrepreneurs that uh, are building these, uh, these, uh, these industries, these new companies. So it took until the spring of 2014, and it happened. Again, one day, it probably wasn't warm because it was March, and now that I work at the Canadian Securities Exchange, I don't have my feet up on the desk very much anymore. Again, <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> um, our head of listings came to uh, have a conversation with me. He said, Richard, we've got companies from, from, who are applying for their medical marijuana license, and they're applying. And another exchange group in Canada has said they won't take them because they don't think they're pursuing active businesses. I said, what are they talking about? They're pursuing an active business. Some of these businesses to build out their operation are going to need $100, 200000000 million in capital. How are they supposed to get that if they can't go into the public equity markets? Private equity is not going to do it for them certainly looks like an active business, as far as we can tell, just as much as a, as a uh, mining exploration company or a life sciences company that's uh, investigating a new compound. I mean, these companies actually have a clear path to profitability if they get the uh, license that they're looking for. This is crazy. Sure, of course we can list these companies. Well, guess what happened? So, you'll see the big jump in uh, the spring of uh, 2014. That was uh, basically companies like uh, Aurora Cannabis, Supreme Pharmaceuticals, and uh, about 25 other uh, cannabis issuers that uh, joined the exchange over the course of a two or three month period. And it took a while for the trading to build up, but look what happened. I mean, every entrepreneur in the room has uh, done a hockey stick chart showing that, uh, hey, if this works, this is what it's going to look like. Well, guess what? There, there it is. And when you look at the January to April numbers for 2018, uh, we're, again, going to have to recalibrate uh, the, the scale uh, when you see the annual numbers at the end of this year. Again, market capitalization. Um, it's a little bit off from the end of uh, 2017 uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one. Uh, there was obviously a very large run-up in the cannabis space at the end of, uh, at the, end of the year. And secondly, uh, our first billion-dollar corporation, uh, CanTrust, uh, decided that they would uh, divest their U.S. assets and go to the <coughs> Toronto Stock Exchange uh, because uh, they were hopeful of joining the, uh, uh, the Composite Index. And they had hopes of, uh, have hopes of, uh, raising uh, significant institutional capital to build their war chest and make further investments in the cannabis space in, uh, in Canada only. So as I say, we had a, a rather large def uh, defection that uh, took us down a little bit, as well as the uh, sell-off in the cannabis space. But we're still over $10 billion in market capitalization collectively uh, at the end of the quarter. You can read this as, uh, as well as I can, but obviously 2017 was the watershed year. Uh, this is the year that we began to feel that we really kind of made it. Um, we were relevant in the Canadian uh, capital markets. And really, when you look at it overall, uh, the cannabis space was the opportunity that we were looking for. Again, combined with this entire ecosystem that supports early stage capital formation in Canada, We've created an entire new industry over the course of four years that's gone from zero to almost $30 billion in market capitalization. And we actually haven't seen, you know, that th this movie's not even over. In fact, we're probably in the you know, bottom of the first at this point. You know, the companies that will emerge as the, uh, the big players, we pro probably don't exist yet. Uh, because again, what industry do you know of where the farmers are the ones who make all the money? Uh, none, that I, none that I can think of. Uh, obviously, it's Anheuser-Busch that makes all the money from beer. It's not the guy who grows the high-quality hops. The guy who grows the high-quality hops is necessary to the process, but obviously, it's Anheuser-Busch and the consumer packaging space and marketing that, uh, that have uh, secured the margins. Exactly the same thing is going to happen in the cannabis space. We're also particularly proud of the fact that companies listed on the exchange raised more than a billion dollars. Um, 
and it was uh, transactions about two per business day last year. So again, our promise to the companies that uh, join the Canadian Securities Exchange is that they can use the exchange as a platform not just to provide secondary market liquidity for the earlier stage investors, but as a platform to raise additional money. And as I say, they did so in, in record fashion last year. And again, my favorite day, December 28th. Um, I was skiing that day, <laughs> so I didn't have my feet up on the desk. Um, here's a little secret. Um, in the securities industry, uh, the period between uh, Christmas and New Year's um, is referred to as a blackout period from a technology perspective. So all of the dealers and all of the exchanges on the street quietly try to basically take down a bunch of their systems to do upgrades, software, new software is installed, uh, the server farms are culled, and new, new equipment, new hardware is added in, communications networks are upgraded, um, because it's traditionally the quietest period uh, of trading of the, of, the, of the course of the year. Now, the interesting thing about the cannabis space, also augmented by fintech, um, blockchain, and some of the other companies that have uh, joined the exchange later in 2017, is that they're very much a retail story. And so I think we can all remember what the weather was like this year uh, between Christmas and New Year's. It was absolutely freezing cold in eastern Canada, and the weather was miserable out west. What happened was people went down in their basements, put another log in the fire, and they traded stocks. <laughs> they absolutely traded stocks. And the stocks that they were trading, by and large, were listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange. So as you can see, that day, we traded 455 million shares, uh, more shares than were traded on the Venture Exchange or on the Toronto Stock Exchange, more trades than took place on the Venture Exchange, and more value that took place on the Venture Exchange. I mean, these are achievements that even a year ago, uh, we didn't have any hopes that we were going to you know, achieve these, these, these benchmarks. The other part that we don't have on the slide here and um, you know, I, I particularly enjoyed this, uh, this aspect of it. So remember I talked about that the, the brokers uh, tend to uh, uh, use this quiet period as an opportunity to um, uh, you know, do systems changes and upgrades and so on. In past years when I was here talking about the challenges of getting the Canadian Securities Exchange uh, up and running, one of our big issues was access to the discount brokers operated by the banks in Canada. So the independent discount brokers embraced us at an early stage. They provided access to our uh, securities. But getting TD Waterhouse, Greenline, the uh, Royal Bank guys, the, you know, all of the other discount brokers operated by the big banks were extremely reluctant for a whole bunch of political and technical reasons to basically connect to our services. And that was an enormous issue for us, convincing somebody to list on the exchange when, in fact, people at uh, half of the discount brokers on the street weren't able to trade the stock. Okay? So that was a big problem and it was a big achievement for us. RBC and TD, their systems fell over on the 28th. The, pay, the, the, the order flow for CSC companies was so great that the systems actually collapsed. So those numbers would actually have been significantly bigger uh, if those uh, brokerage firms were able to uh, trade that day. The other systems all reported significant slowdowns in uh, customer response. And in fact, the amount of volume being done was so great that the internal systems that the advisors were using to get updates for quotes to be able to enter orders from their clients uh, into the system were also incredibly slow. Uh, BMO advisor told me it took her 45 minutes uh, to get an order into, the, into their system for a Canadian Securities Exchange listed stock. So as I say, it was a great day for us. It could actually have been a lot better. Um, but we also sort of took some pride in the fact that guys who had been really mean to us for a long time you know, kind of uh, had, a, had a rough day as a result of our success. In any event, um, this, again, is what disruption looks like. And so when we were sitting back and thinking, low those many years ago, about you know, how do we make a better exchange? How do we create a better market? How do we do it more efficiently, how, more cheaply? offer a superior level of customer service to issuers and to potential investors and to the dealer community. I'd say this is pretty good affirmation that, uh, that we got there. 
And I think, oh, sorry. Two minutes? Okay. <laughs> oh, two more slides. Oh, thanks, Liz. Uh, Mike Gundy told me that I had to remind everybody that uh, apparently today is the 40th anniversary of the Cheech and Chong Up in Smoke movie, <laughs> which I guess is a nice segue into this uh, slide. So yes, we were talking about the cannabis space um, and you know how important it is to the Canadian Securities Exchange. Um, again, we're, we're now almost, uh, or more, slightly more than 70 companies uh, that are listed amongst the 350 odd issuers uh, on the exchange. Um, so about one in five companies, but uh, it's about uh, half of the market capitalization at, uh, at this point. Now, as the year progresses, um, we're actually going to see um, a greater diversification in, the, in terms of the number of stories. Uh, recently, we've seen, um, I think the last four or five issuers have all been in the mining space. Uh, so we're seeing mining companies uh, get uh, funded and uh, coming into the, back into the public markets at this point, uh, which is good. Uh, a very healthy sign. We continue to see fintech companies uh, come in, particularly those that are interested in the blockchain space. Um, and uh, we are working at this point on about 100 active applications. Um, these are better, bigger, more mature companies than we have ever seen. Uh, and uh, the conversion rate for these companies, and they've already paid us money uh, to initiate this uh, process. Um, these companies, uh, we expect to see uh, a very high percentage of them on the exchange at some point in the next six to nine months. So our goal of hitting 500 companies, uh, we're, not that, we're not that far off. Um, so as I say, we're very pleased with the uh, progress that we've seen so far. And you're right, there is, what are we up to now? So one final note, um, we're, not just, we're not done the disruption yet. Um, so far, we've been involved in trading, listing of uh, cash equity securities. The next big thing in this world, in fact, it's going to change everything, is the so-called tokenization of securities. So yeah, this is a, this is a blockchain term. Um, we're going to see the end of paper certificates. We're going to see the end of the old-fashioned ways of clearing and settling uh, equity transactions that... Uh, currently done by the Canadian Depositories for Securities, which uh, not coincidentally is wholly owned by the TMX group. Uh, and they haven't been particularly friendly to us uh, over the course of our existence, to put it mildly. Um, so we are, and we have announced uh, plans to launch our own blockchain-based clearing and settlement system for securities tokens. Now, why are we doing this? This makes so much sense for everybody in the food chain, uh, it's remarkable that uh, you know, we are, in fact, the leaders uh, in this space. For issuers, Mr. Caldwell talked about the expense of paying out dividends. Right? It's incredibly expensive right now to pay a dividend or a royalty payment or whatever. The issuer has to pay the transfer agent. The transfer agent pays the CDS. The CDS pays the custodian. I mean, there are a lot of mouths to feed before that money winds up in the pocket of your shareholder. And everybody takes a little slice along the way. So it discourages pay companies from paying dividends or, or having royalty streaming products uh, listed on the public markets. So with a smart contract using a blockchain, the issuer, in fact, can pay directly to their individual and shareholder. The shareholders will also be completely known, visible, transparent to the issuer. Well, think what that means from a shareholder communications, investor relations, proxy voting perspective. It cuts out all of these middlemen that are in the, you know, that are in the space. Or, and this is for my friend from uh, AST, CST, who's here, <laughs> it forces them to basically add value where they can and not just sort of you know, sit there and shuffle paper as we've been doing since some point in the late 19th century. You know, my joke is that the way we do things now is a 19th century business process powered by 20th century technology. It's hideously expensive, and as I say, it constrains people from doing all sorts of things in the public markets that will be beneficial for issuers and for the shareholders. Now, from the broker perspective, this is also 
an incredible change because right now, and this I'm getting deep into the extremely unsexy area of the back office of securities processing, but it's the last area that has defied any kind of uh, any any kind of innovation to reduce costs and improve performance uh, in the entire industry. So right now, brokers have to wait t plus two for that trade day plus two days before the effect of the trade that you did, in effect, three days ago, is reflected in your account. They have to post security against the potential failure of that trade. And for the stocks that are listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange, which generally trade for less than a dollar, it's 135% of the trade value that they have to post. It's millions of dollars that are tied up doing nothing. We're talking about having trades clear immediately. So no need, you can take all of that capital that's currently residing at the clearinghouse to support the potential for failure or errors and redeploy it to, frankly, more useful goals. It also eliminates errors. Uh, it means we don't have to have a central counterparty guarantee that's provided by CDS, so we don't have to run around and, and arrange for billions of dollars in standby financing against the failure of an individual brokerage firm. As I say, it is such a good idea from so many different directions uh, that this is, uh, this is going to be an enormous winner. And for the exchange, it means that all of the people who have been talking about uh, issuing tokenized securities or in some cases already have, in likely contravention of uh, securities laws, we can bring them back into the light, into the conventional securities trading uh, framework, and uh, again, provide a whole new avenue for people to, to invest. And so, you know, when people talk about tokenizing securities, well, that must be the, you know, the fintech guys, the blockchain guys, the, you know, somebody wants to trade Bitcoin or Ether or something like that. It's actually not that at all. Within a couple of days of announcing, I had a group of miners approach, uh, approach the exchange and say, we want to use this facility to basically securitize gold that's in the ground, and we can provide a streaming royalty instead of to one of the majors, like a Glencore or Franco Nevada or uh, Wheaton Precious Metals. We can market this deal to the public. Guess what? Glencore is looking for a 90% discount on the gold in the ground. Do you think an institution might, say, take an 80% or a 75% discount and buy into that deal for, in return for the revenue stream? Again, all of these deals that are currently done in the, in the private markets can be brought into the public markets at a significantly better and more advantageous uh, terms for the issuer. We've also had people that securitize the back catalogs of musicians' approaches. Okay. Again, this is a private equity deal, right? We all know about uh, Michael Jackson having bought the Beatles back catalog and getting a royalty payment every time a song was played or they you know, licensed it to, for an ad or something like that. Huge moneymaker. Again, you can't do that deal in a public vehicle now because the cost of processing all of those payments and those royalties is, uh, would make it prohibitive. With the blockchain, it's really easy. There's no friction. So we've had two different groups that are looking to securitize back catalogs for musicians that you've heard of approach us and say, yeah, we're going to put together a fund and we'll be able to market this deal to the public. And what's more, in addition to royalty payments, you'll be able to, again, on the blockchain, through the digital wallets and so on, they'll be able to send you the next song or a video. They'll be able to provide all kinds of additional content, not just uh, you know, your 18 cents a, a token or whatever the, uh, the royalty stream is. It just opens up so many new opportunities for the securities market to service. In any event, that's one of the things we're working on this year. <laughs> but uh, no, we have, uh, we, have, uh, we have high hopes. And the last thing is, uh, and again, Mr. Caldwell talked a little bit about this, you know, meeting with people who've never heard of Urbana. And of course, we continue to meet with people, fewer people than we used to, who haven't heard of the Canadian Securities Exchange. So a big focus of, of the team is to basically continue to pound home the message here in Canada, in the United States, and internationally. Uh, I was in Israel last week, uh, which I think will be 
a very, very active source of uh, companies for the Canadian Securities Exchange in the, uh, in the next uh, couple of years, um, is to basically continue to develop our brand. Again, our, our, our chairman wants us to be edgy and out there and entrepreneurial, and I, I hope we've given you a bit of a taste of that this morning, that uh, even though I do put my feet up on the desk and think about stuff from time to time, we are out there pounding the pavement and, uh, and, uh, and, and working it as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm delighted to take them. Yes, sir. Which blockchain company are you, are you planning to use for your affairs, for securities? Oh, uh, we're working with our uh, existing trading systems technology provider, New York-based company called Fundamental Interactions. Um, we will be deploying a private Ethereum protocol blockchain network, and we'll be using a, a standard uh, uh, Ethereum token, which is uh, the ERC-20 uh, uh, protocol, uh, or specification rather, uh, if you're interested in looking it up for the, for the smart contracts that will represent the tokens. Uh, we're probably a couple of weeks away from uh, putting this out, uh, the facility out into our test environment. Uh, we will be working with uh, a number of the uh, dealers uh, and custodians and uh, issuers to uh, basically have this in our test environment to run trades through the full cycle understand better uh, what components of the workflow need to be adjusted uh, on the dealer side. Um, my quick take is, and, and I've, again, I've never been involved in a project uh, where I've had greater um, support uh, from the industry, uh, including the big banks. I, I was astounded uh, at how excited they are to work with us on this, uh, on this project. Um, but my, my sense is that the biggest challenge is going to be getting uh, fiat cash into the system from, from, the bank, uh, uh, from the bank payment systems because their payment systems were developed at some point in the late 1970s. Uh, they're batch-based and they're very difficult to adjust. And so I think likely we're going to see the banks have to do some different hacks in order to get the money in uh, and then deal with the back-end client account, uh, cash accounting uh, in, in, in the background. But uh, we're hopeful that we'll be uh, uh, live uh, before the end of the first quarter, 2019. Thank you. By the way, that you have now exhausted all of my technical knowledge about the blockchain. So <laughs> this is a follow-on conversation about the technology. There's not, I got nothing. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, question on, you said one, of the, one company that was listening with you guys moved over to the TSX to try and get listed. Uh, or sorry, to include it in the index. Um, That's correct. What, if anything, can you do to make companies stay and still be part of the index? Uh, the answer is absolutely nothing. Um, the reason for that <laughs> is this is one of the worst self-inflicted wounds in the, in the history of the Canadian financial services world. Uh, a long time ago, um, I ran the index group at the Toronto Stock Exchange, among other uh, business lines. And I was responsible for doing the deal with Standard & Poor's when we uh, outsourced the management of the index and co-branded and did a variety of things. And one of the terms and conditions uh, that I insisted on uh, was uh, I was uh, unfortunately smart enough to see that there might someday be multiple exchanges in Canada. Uh, I insisted that in order to be included in the index, you had to be listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Uh, that uh, agreement is still in place. And so you have to be listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange if you're going to be in the, in the composite index. Um, so unfortunately, we have, uh, I mean, we've complained to the, uh, the competition authorities and, uh, you know, applied business pressure and so on. But, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, back, there, there used to be a rule that you had to be on the, uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange to be in the S&P 500. Um, you know, then those little companies like Microsoft, Dell, Intel, Cisco, Apple, uh, grew up on the, on, the, on the NASDAQ, and they got big enough that basically institutional investors eventually smacked S&P upside the head and said, look, um, you know, you've got to include these companies if you're going to be a reputable benchmark. We really have to do, you know, get ourselves into the same position. Um, so 
The interesting thing is that the companies that are sticky to us will be the US-based uh, uh, US cannabis uh, companies. Uh, for a variety of reasons, the other guys have elected not to, uh, uh, to uh, list those, uh, those, the shares of those companies. And uh, so we're hoping that uh, you know, we'll have several billion dollar US uh, cannabis related companies on the exchange and uh, again eventually the investment community will, will smack S&P upside the head and uh, you know, have the same effect here. But as I say, it was, this was entirely my own doing and you know, <laughs> if I could have some, you know, <laughs> maybe not the only do over in my life, but that would be one of them. <laughs> In the immortal words of the great Rhode Island philosopher Peter Griffin, can it be both? Um, Urbana is listed both on the TMX and the CSE. It doesn't cost that much. I mean, how big a sale is it to say, come on, guys, we made it happen for you. It costs, what does it cost to list on the CSE? It doesn't cost anything at all for a billion dollar company. Just s stay listed on us. We helped you get started. Karma's a real thing. <laughs> of all people, cannabis companies should know that. <laughs> That's what yes. I was going to say. Can't you run it through? Our brand is listed on the T as uh, what is it? Yes. There are a bunch of reasons. The, the, the dealers actually don't like it very much because their systems can't figure out how to deal with the companies that are listed on both markets. So. Uh, what, what they tend to do, for example, in the case of Urbana, and we have had a few that have been uh, interlisted uh, between the two exchanges, uh, what the companies or what the dealers tend to do is they will simply point at the other guys for all of the trading activity. So that w which sort of takes away from the, uh, you know, why, why would you pay money to be listed on an exchange where you're not actually ever going to do anything, but in any event. All right, well, thank you very kindly. And uh, again, I would be remiss if I didn't finish. This. I'm sorry, you had a question? Is, is there a um, possibility of setting up a, a marketable index for the, the, the CSX, like TS, TSX has? Or um, I, I've heard of, anyway, go ahead, I'll let you. Yeah, we actually have uh, uh, two indices. Um, and uh, we created a 25 index uh, just this year uh, with, with exactly that, um, that idea. Um, so far, the, and I also happen to know something about the ETF space because I helped invent that too. Um, but um, the, uh, the issue is there's, been a, there's too much turnover uh, in the 25. Like, so when we do the quarterly rebalance, I think last time we had like 11 names shifted. And that does not make it uh, you know, particularly tradable or cost-effective uh, uh, underlying index. So we've, we've had some interest uh, from some folks to do, you know, potentially, for example, the cannabis uh, index and the cannabis ETF. Um, again, the uh, uh, custodians got a little weird about, uh, uh, you know, keeping the, keeping the stocks because the, most of the custodians have uh, U.S. roots um, and uh, are, again, concerned about uh, their legal liability for, for doing that. So. That has inhibited uh, the product development uh, in, in that space, but it's, it's something that we're definitely uh, looking at and uh, thinking about all the time. Um, again, I would be remiss if I did not thank uh, uh, the Urbana management team and the shareholders for their support for us. As I say, we, we knew we just needed that chance, and uh, we are so glad and grateful that uh, we got it. And, uh, we did, in fact, have an opportunity to, I think, really make a difference uh, the Canadian capital markets and uh, hopefully to the uh, Urbana portfolio as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. And uh, you can see why my enthusiasm about the Canadian Securities Exchange, that's, that's going to be a winner for us, I think. Well, it is now. Anyway, thank you for coming. Have a great day. There's still probably a few sandwiches left. And... Uh, I'll uh, wander around for a while, and some of our partners will, so you feel free to chat with us. Thank you for coming again. Much appreciated.